Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Julie Warnicky, and um, I said that I was going to talk about the introduction of monoids today. Um, we're actually going to be talking about semigroups a lot. Monoids were um, when I first started learning about monoids, um, which I guess other people here, there must be people here who don't know who I am. So I'm one of the co-authors of Haskell Programming from First Principles, more commonly known as Haskell Book. I learned Haskell while I was writing the book. That was part of the deal of writing Haskell book, is that um, Chris Allen, the co-author, uh, was a Haskell programmer. And he thought, well, we need better materials for Haskell for total beginners. So if I write a book with a total beginner, then um, everything that she doesn't understand as we go through the book, then we'll get covered, right? So it turned out to be a very long book. Um, it's about a thousand pages because there were a lot of things I didn't understand. Um, it was kind of when we got to, um, got around to writing about monoids that I really felt like I was starting to understand Haskell, um, which if you're familiar with the book, that doesn't come until about halfway through the book. <laughs> but um, that's when I finally felt like type classes were starting to make sense then, and a lot of the patterns in Haskell started to make sense all of a sudden. Um, and ever since then, I've been sort of fascinated by monoids and um, have been uh, sort of researching them, I guess, a lot. Not that I'm an expert or anything, but um, they're just interesting. But we're actually going to talk about semigroups quite a bit because um, I think that semigroups in Haskell are treated like a sort of, um, you know, shameful country cousin to monoids, and really they shouldn't be, right? Um, I think semi-group, the semi-group package is now in base, but it's not yet in prelude. So still, we're, we're moving ever closer to having semi-groups be, you know, a real useful thing in Haskell, but they're, I think we're not quite there yet. So um, we're going to talk about semi-groups a little bit and why we want them. Um, I'm not going to explain, when, when they ask you to talk, or when I agreed to talk here, I was supposed to give an introductory Haskell talk, and um, I didn't know what introductory was supposed to mean for a group like this. Um, but I'm not going to be talking about like how type classes work in Haskell or the type system. So, okay. All right. So, what is a semigroup? A semigroup is an algebraic structure consisting of a set together with a binary associative operation. What's a monoid? A monoid is an algebraic structure consisting of a set with a binary associative operation with an identity value. Okay, so the difference between, so an algebraic structure is a set plus some kind of operation. Just simplify somewhat. Okay? So the difference between a semigroup and a monoid is the presence of an identity value. Right? All right. So, um, this is not, despite what it may seem like in Haskell, this is not actually less important than a monoid. Because there are a lot of operations that are useful and valid operations over certain types of sets that just don't have an identity value. Okay. I'm really nervous. <laughs> All right. So, Let's talk for a minute about um, what a binary associative operation is. Canonically, we think of a binary oper associative operation for um, a semigroup or a monoid as multiplication. Right? So it's the application of, so we write it like, um, we write it like this, right? Well, that's not a good example. But, you kind of write it like this, and it's the application of, sorry, and it's the application of this binary associative operation to the ordered pair x and y. And we tend to think of it as multiplication. But it doesn't have to be multiplication, right? There are a lot of other binary associative operations, such as addition, obviously, is another one, right? Now, when we think about multiplication and addition, though, typically they have an identity value, right? 
the identity value for multiplication being one, the identity or some equivalent of one, the identity value for addition being zero, right? But there are, I actually don't know the semi-group multiplication, that's actual multiplication with numbers, but there is a semi-group addition. If you're using only positive numbers that don't have a zero, then your addition is semi-groupal, not monoidal, because there's no zero, right? There's no identity value. So, um, the important thing is that the binary associative operation is not just an operation, but an operation over a certain type of set, right? And so, a set might have different um, semi-group operations, right? You can have multiplication and addition, obviously, for many types. Um, the set of integers also has minimum and maximum, which are semi-group operations. Um, yes, and, um, and they also don't have identity values, right? Minimum and maximum. So, not typically. So those are semi-group operations. All right. Um, another example of a semi-group operation is a non-empty list under concatenation. So the list monoid that concatenates two lists, right, is sort of one of the first monoids that you learn about when you're learning about monoids in Haskell, right? But we do have a data type in Haskell called non-empty, which is also um, not in prelude or anything like that, so you have to import it. And um, and I wish that it worked so, but there it is. This is what the using the data type, the non-empty data type looks like to do concatenation. You can see there instead of using the normal plus plus for concatenation, we use the semi-group append. Okay. And that just concatenates the two lists, but it is a semi-group operation, there's no identity. So you can't do this with an empty list because there is no empty list in non-empty. Okay. All right, so a monoid is like a semi-group that has that identity element. And the identity element is relative to both the operation and the set, right, as we were just talking about. Um, probably looking around at what you've been nodding at, um, probably already understand what the identity value is, so we'll skip some of that. All right, so let's talk about why we want identity values or sometimes don't want identity values. Why we sometimes want a monoid and sometimes we want a semi-group. So there was a thing going around on Twitter for a while where um, somebody tweeted, tweeted this line of JavaScript and said, oh, JavaScript already supports alternative facts or something like that, right? Um, because what is it doing here? It's taking the minimum of an empty list Right, and the maximum of an empty list, and um, comparing them, right? So, should the minimum of an empty list be less than the maximum of an empty list? Right. I mean, it's a question, right? Because, huh? Undefined. It should be undefined, right? It has to allow for an exception, right? We can't do, we can't uh, take the minimum or the maximum of an empty list and has to just throws an exception. Well, so what's the difference here? In Java, these are, or sorry, JavaScript, these are like monoidal folds. There's an identity value, and so when you take the minimum or the maximum of an empty list, you're getting the identity value. Which, I don't know JavaScript very well, but I think it's probably an empty list. And so then when you compare two empty lists... It might be not an empty list. <laughs> when, when you compare two empty lists, they should be equal, which means that they're not less than, which means it returns false. So in some sense, if you're thinking of minimum and maximum of empty lists as monoidal, so they're returning an identity element, then this makes sense, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no? <laughs> what should it return? To throw an exception? Yeah. 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 Well, that's what Haskell does, right? Because Haskell's better, obviously. <laughs> so Haskell throws the exception because in Haskell, these are semi-group, right? We're folding a semi-group operation over, over the list. And so it doesn't return an empty value. <clears throat> Sorry, an identity value. Right, so 
if we do that, we just get an exception. So we can't, if, we, if you try to compare them, it'll just do the same thing, right? All right, so this led to a long conversation between um, a friend of mine and I about whether or not you want to throw an exception or return false, right? I mean, if you're comparing an empty list to an empty list, then one is not less than the other, right? So in some sense, the JavaScript behavior makes sense. It's a question of whether or not you want to throw the exception, or maybe what would be better is just not allow us to use minimum and maximum on empty lists, right? If those, if minimum and maximum say only worked with a non-empty list, then we could get a type error maybe instead of an exception, and that would be even better, right? <laughs> All right. So you can make Haskell do um, what the JavaScript does if you want to. Um, I don't know, can you see the, yeah. So you can do this, for example, and make Haskell behave the way JavaScript does, should you want that behavior. Um, because in Haskell we can do, we can do what we want. All right. All right, so that's one time that we probably don't want to return an identity value. We want the semi-group instead of the long one, right? All right, now, um, a time when we want a monoid, but not a semi-group, even though um, a lot of people don't really realize it or think about it, is when we have the tuple applicative. So applicatives are, um, everybody's familiar with applicatives, right? Just a little, okay. So applicatives are um, monoidal, right? They're monoidal functors. So there's a monoidal structure to an applicative functor. <coughs> or substructure, or I'm not sure what the proper term for it is exactly, but there's a, there's a monoidalness to applicative functors, right? So when you write the tuple applicative, as you can see here, right, the A value, what would be the A value of the tuple, right? The string, and this string here, there's no operation joining them, right? Nothing explicit, right? And yet, as we see in the result, of course, these have addition, right? And so they get added together with the applicative. But as we see in the result, that those strings got concatenated, right? And what's causing the concatenation? Where's the concatenation coming from? What? Huh? Oh, this one? Yeah, it's coming from the monoid constraint on the A value. All right, so if you look at the instance, for tuples, the applicative instance for tuples, there's a monoid constraint on the A value, right? All right, so one of the questions is, one of the, everybody's staring over here. I was just wondering if something was going on over there. Um, so one of the questions is, why do we have a monoid constraint on that A and not perhaps a semi-group? Because pure. Right, because pure needs the memty value, which is the identity value from the monoid type class, right? Why do we need the memty? I mean, we want some kind of monoidal operation to do something with those A values, right? And the A values, when we write in the applicative instance, the A values are part of the, the type structure, right? because of the kindness, right? Everybody's with me on that? Mm -hmm. So we have to partially apply the tuple constructor to the A. So now the A is part of the structure. Which means we can't really do anything to the A, right? <coughs> we can't apply a function to it, and we can't change it, right? We're not supposed to change that structure. So what does Menti give us that we couldn't get from a semi-group? It gives us the ability to, in pure, in our implementation of pure here, right, gives us the ability to parametrically not change that A value, right? For whatever type the A is in our tuple, we have an identity value for it because we have that, we specify that it has a monoid constraint, and so now there's an identity value for it so that we can do something with those A values, right? but we have an identity value so that we can parametrically not change that structure. 
Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So this is actually the stuff that um, this is actually the stuff where I started getting really excited about monoids when I was um, when I was learning monoids. The the identity value stuff is cool, and the relationship between monoids and applicative functors is really interesting to me. But um, when I was first learning about monoids, this is actually the stuff that we're about to talk about that got me really, really excited about monoids. <coughs> All right, so Boolean algebra and set theory are connected to each other, right? There's a relationship between them, um, a very close relationship. And for any arithmetic operation, there's actually an analog in set theory, right? Or maybe that's not the right way to put that. But so for, um, okay, let me back up. I'm getting nervous again. All right, so if we look at the Boolean truth tables for conjunction and disjunction, right? We'll just focus on conjunction and disjunction, right? Is this, I think I got this right for conjunction, right? For every case, it'll return false except for when there's two true values, right? Mm -hmm. And for disjunction, we'll return false only in the case where both are false, right? So one thing that, and these are implemented as any and all, as the any and all new type monoids, right, in, in Haskell. So because they're related to the any and all functions, right, the any and all Boolean functions. So, so we have, for Booleans, we have these monoids that are explicitly conjunction and disjunction, right? Which is cool. But if you notice, like with maybe, right, one possible monoid for maybe could do the same thing as Boolean conjunction, right? It could return a nothing in every case, except for when we had two just case, right? That's a monoid that you can make happen for maybe, right? I don't think, I can never remember what the actual default maybe monoid is because it's not a good one, but <laughs> um, I don't think it's that. <clears throat> but that's a monoid that you can use. And then this just A that's here, right, this could either be a choice of one or the other just. You could left bias it or right bias it, or you could take the, both of the just and just append the A values, right? And that is what the default maybe monoid actually does when you get two justs, right? And then we have first and last, which are either right, left biased or right biased. <coughs> but they're not, they're still not conjunctive. Now this is, um, one way I started to think about this is that this is kind of error propagating, right? Anytime you get a nothing, then it's gonna sort of propagate that error, right? You're just gonna get a nothing back. And that may not be what you want from, from your maybe monoid. Right, that may not be the behavior that you want from your maybe monoid. <coughs> um, but that is, and again, getting back to that connection between the monoids and the applicative functors, that is what we get from the maybe applicative, right? If either side of the applicative operation is a nothing, you'll get the nothing back. So we've, so we've decided with the monoid that we want this kind of, a kind of error correcting behavior where you only get a nothing back if you have two nothings. Right? But we've decided with the applicative, we want this kind of error propagating behavior where if either side is a nothing, we get the nothing back. Right? And I say we've decided because you can do, it could be otherwise, but we use alternative for that, the alternative type class, right? To have the error correcting behavior for applicatives. All right. So, and then here's the sort of disjunctive, right? If we're thinking of it in, the, in terms of a Boolean truth table, here's the sort of disjunctive maybe monoid, right? And this is what actually most people want for their monoid, right? For their maybe monoid. Some kind of error correcting behavior where the only time we get that nothing is when both are nothing, right? But these are all possible monoids of maybe, right? All right, so why was this so exciting for me? <laughs> This is exciting for me because um, I realized that this pattern holds for a whole bunch of different types, right? Because again, there's a connection between this and addition and subtraction for integers. No, sorry, not addition and subtraction, addition and multiplication for integers, right? Or for other types of numbers. There's a connection between the, the set theory, notions of conjunction and disjunction and addition and multiplication, 
which I'm not going to get into because I haven't found a good way to explain it to other people yet. It makes sense to me, but for some reason I can't teach it yet. So, um, so this was exciting to me um, when I discovered this because eventually it led me to realize that um, it's the same pattern that types also have in Haskell, right? Some and product types. Right? There's some types which are, which are disjunctive, right? They're ors. You get this value or this value, right? And we have product types which are conjunctive, right? To make a value of this type, you, have, you need to have a conjunction of other types, right? And so that's why I, um, that's how I ended up getting so into monoids because um, that having that pattern be consistent all throughout Haskell is really interesting. It turns out that types themselves are a monoidal category. So um, that's, that's how I started this all And I'm way short of time. Sorry. Do you have questions? Do you want to talk about two minutes more? The connection between monoids and applicatives? <coughs> Yes. yes. Okay. I wrote a whole blog post about that, um, but we can talk about that. So, right here. All right. So, most of the time, the fact that the connection between monoids and applicatives is not, um, I think, it's not obvious to most people. And I actually, um, um, well, I thought that this example should be in the documentation for um, tuples because I think that a lot of people are surprised. When I've been teaching Haskell, I find that a lot of people are very surprised by this behavior. They don't understand what is causing the two strings to concatenate. I'm not sure what they think should happen, and whether it should just choose one or the other A value or just kind of lump them together in some kind of unprincipled fashion. I'm not really sure what they think should happen. Um, but so it turns out that because there's that monoid constraint on right, that monoid constraint there on the applicative for tuples, um, that we have a principled way to join those two A values, right? All right. So it turns out that, um, and I talked about how that's because of the structure, and. Um, So effectively what's happening is GHC is resolving that multiplication to the type class, the applicative type class, modoidal type class yeah. for string. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So whatever whatever your A value gets, you know, is, whatever type that is, it'll use whatever the default monoid is for that. Yeah. Well, whatever monoid is in scope. Yes. Yeah. Which, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, could you talk a little bit more about what, what you're saying about uh, types and cells being a monoidal category? <clears throat> sure, although again, that's not, um, I'm not an expert at that at all, because that was kind of my first, that was kind of my first introduction to category theory. Someone had sent me a long time ago this blog post about like understanding algebraic data types, and he goes into why they're a monoidal category. And when I was a beginner, I didn't understand that blog post at all. Then, as I realized, um, <clears throat> as I got um, sort of more understanding of what monoids were about, then it started to make more sense. So, um, so just like addition and multiplication are monoids for numbers, right? And conjunction and disjunction are sort of standard monoids for a lot of other types. Um, some in product, which are disjunctive and conjunctive, are <coughs> the operations that we have for types, right? The standard operations that we have for types. So each one of those is a monoidal operation over the set of types. And are you going to correct me if I say something wrong? Yeah. <laughs> when you say some, do you mean either? Yeah, I mean a some type. Right. Yeah. Like either is on your screen. 
that's uh, that's your sum. Oh yeah, sure. We can use either for a for a sum type, right? All right. So then, if we say that they're monoidal types, right? If that 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 category of types is monoidal, that must mean it has has binary operation, right? Which is either addition or multiplication, sum or product. So, so at the type level, it's not like we we think of the like the sum operations like typing an additional bar and then another variant of the uh, of, of the type. Yeah, so this bar is, right, this pipe is a sort of disjunctive, right? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, it's disjunctive. So, um, well, I, when I start talking about this, I feel on shaky ground, particularly because my, my the co-author of my first book used to argue with me about this a lot. I was like, oh, so the pipe is just like always disjunctive in Haskell. He's like, no, no, it's not disjunctive in, in some types. It's like, it totally is disjunctive. It's totally disjunctive because, you know, you get or, right? You have this value or this value. You can't have both at the same time, right? Um, which means it's not an inclusive disjunction, at least not in types. But, so, um, I start feeling on sort of shaky ground. But, um, yeah, so we have, this is disjunctive. So, but it's a monoid. I mean, I said it was a monoidal category, right? So, that must mean it also has... It has this operation, and it also has. What does the, the monoid also have to have? An identity. an identity value, right? So, what's the identity value for this? What, is, what does that even mean? That took me a long time to wrap my head around what that even means to have an identity value for a type. Um, yeah, for right for addition, right? We need a zero. What's a zero for type? At the type level, we need a type that has no data constructors, right? So we need void. Now, can you represent that in Haskell? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Data void. Yeah. Data void. Data void. Okay. Yeah. And so then. That's enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but for product types, then the identity value is a data type that only has one constructor because we need a one value, right? And that is unit, right? Yeah. So we have these two identity values. We have the two operations on the set of types, right? Because a monoid is an algebraic structure that has a set and a binary operation with an identity value, right? A binary associative operation, sorry. So we have that for types, right? We actually have two binary associative operations each with their own identity value, right? So they are also a monoidal category in themselves. So this was kind of the first, it was when we were writing the monoid chapter, that's why this chapter is so important to me. It was when we were writing the monoid chapter and I started thinking more about what does it mean for, you know, disjunctive monoids, what does that mean? And I started, and that's how I first started getting interested in category theory. Um, and I think that's, um, I think that that's why I keep sort of learning Haskell because um, I don't do a lot of actual programming even still, um, but there's just always more to, there's always depth, right? There's patterns and there's consistency and there's always more to sort of explore. So, yeah. Um, this, I've been watching projects this time. Yeah. So, you just said that uh, some is destructive. Mm -hmm. But I think this is this is what I'm not going to do. But I feel like it's disjunctive at the value level. Because there's still going to be some data that you're still there. But at the value level, you, you, you have one or the other as an estimate. And the reason why the part is random is that because each of these products and co products, and co products are products, and you do the co product. Right, but that's true. Um, so you're asking why um, I'm saying that it's a disjunction at the type level instead of at the value level because at the value level is that's when you only have one or the other. <clears throat> Whereas at the type level, they're both there, right, as part of the type. 
but that's, I mean, to me, I think of it as like, um, and again, I assume someone will correct me if I go wrong, but um, to me, I think of it as like, if you're doing a, just to take like really basic Boolean disjunction, right? You would type like say true or false, right? So there, they're both there, right? But then it's only gonna return one, right? So that's at the, I mean, obviously that is all term level there. That's all value level there, but it's like, to take in the original disjunctive expression, they're both there, but then we're only going to return one. And so I think of it, I think of the sum type as being like that, just a disjunction one more level up, where they're both there in the beginning, but only one of them is going to return, or one of them is going to. I've been trying to stop using the word instantiate because that makes sense to me from my background, but it means a lot of things in programming. <laughs> yeah. That's why you think it's what I'm sorry. I think it's what we call type level either the instruction. Oh yeah, yeah. So yes, so type level either by the by the Curry Howard isomorphism is um, the same as logical disjunction. So yes. can you maybe at your GHCI prompt show some uh, type level like, operations? I don't think I've seen those before. There was the data void mentioned, so that's like a yes. D, but that's a zero type level. Yes. I've never seen that used uh, actually in public production code. But I'd love to see, uh, like, can you just sort of do some operations that illustrate the facts about conjunction and function at the type level? I probably can't do that off the top of my head. No. Huh? You can give me two simple ones. So either is sum, right? Yeah. You can have void left void. Yes. And that's zero plus whatever it is. So it's not actually adding because you could always pick the right and have all of that and void now. So, so can you transform that into some like maybe the state that's not a GFCI swamp that give errors when you try things or so, yeah, I, I'm just sort of trying to see I'd love to see sort of some interactive task that shows this in the action. Because I can't I'm having trouble imagining that, so you have data void fine. It's a, yes. you have, it's a zero at the type level. Yeah. So what can you do with that? Can you construct another type that's in disjunction or conjunction with that? You can, yes. So let's do it. Either void or <coughs> either void or int. Right. Either void or int is the same as as int. So um, I don't know if I can just do that in GHCI, but I guess I guess the theory would be that I mean I I guess I feel this is where people usually say, but what about bottoms? And it's not really saying because I have no But but in theory, it should be that you should be able to have them either, and you should be able to say for you know case either, either, and then you don't even have to match the left branch because it's void, and it won't complain that your pattern matches a complete right because it knows that the left can never happen. Right. But I, I I don't know. I've never used a void type, so I don't know if it's actually. That's no, I'm not sure how useful this is actually in like. But I do, I do feel that this this whole model thing comes up um, with generics. Yes. Um, if you look at a uh, generic, um, they break down some types and product types into you know two generic operators, and you can you know I think they use the they use the unit, and I think there's a void for the, the end of the of the train if you have you know. Yeah. Generics, but but it, it's basically that's yeah. Good. I've just recently started looking at um, generics, and I don't understand it very well. Not well enough to talk about right now. So um, we're writing about it for a new book. So <laughs> we've been yeah, investigating it, but <laughs> off for like three years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, fortunately, my new co-author is actually using generics for uh, for uh, the Haskell he's writing at work, and so he's going to get to teach me about it again. <laughs> the other place that I that I think you would see probably lots of examples is that it's the you know, the type level list, like H list or the records stuff, 
that does a lot of that type of programming because they have to sort of, if you want to recurse over a, you know, variably typed record, then you have to have some way to say, I want to handle this type, and then if you're a some type, I recurse on the next one, or if you're, you know, you, know, you have to sort of have that structural recursion for the types. Yeah. I, well, they told me to repeat stuff that the audience says into the microphone. That was a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's just the short version is that Nginx does probably does that stuff, and the type level records probably do that stuff. Yeah, I think there are reasons to that understanding why there, are, you know, the monoidal level type stuff or the type level monoidal stuff um, is important for a lot of that kind of thing in normal everyday household. I, I don't know how useful it is. Unless you're using it as libraries. Yeah, you yeah. Then you, would, then you might need to care. So, yeah. Well, to finish the thought, I forgot the other half of it. Okay. So you can be either avoidant or something that's zero, so only can be over Right. But if you take the product to zero, you should end up at zero. Yeah. So if you have a two pool and you go void in there, you can never make that type because you have to go void in there. Yes. So it's not to be a zero. Yeah. But if you put a unit in there, if you're not changing that type, you just multiply by one, so it should be a thing. And it is a space in order because you're adding a unit into that pool, it doesn't do anything. It's, it's not actually a question. If you take your two pool and back out, again, it doesn't actually do anything. Yes. So, I guess that's when people say that. That maybe is equivalent to either unit. That's 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 how you could yes. sort of prove that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Basically, this is I think this is again I don't know what I'm talking about, but uh, um, you're, when you're trying to design a type system, you think this way. Write a real program. You know, thinking about types as being model is maybe cool mathematically, but Practically, yeah. It's, uh, I think until you're doing you know, a lot of type level programming, it's probably not that useful to know. We're, we're talking about the type of yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Tell tell you about my other book. Your new book. Oh, so um, now I'm writing um, a new book called The Joy of Haskell, and I do have. Uh, you see I have some Joy of Haskell stickers on my computer, and I do have some of those if you'd like this. Um, we, um, I had the idea when I was writing the first book that I wanted to write a whole appendix to the first book, Haskell book, about the GHC extensions, but there are many, you, you may be aware. And so it kind of got too long to be a useful appendix, and the book is long enough as it is. So. I thought, well, I'll just break that out into a separate book, and it'll be like a kind of reference manual of Haskell, right? Be like, I'll, I'll, we'll have a nice reference for some syntactic stuff that's really easy to forget, right? We'll have a reference for the GHC extensions that'll have examples and, um, you know, explanations of what when they're useful. Then <laughs> I, I started talking to a friend of mine named Chris Martin, who, um, and asked him if he would like to write this book with me, because I think one of Chris Martin's strengths is um, making things really concise. Right? He's very good at that. So, uh, whereas I tend to kind of have verbose explanations and everything. So, I asked him if he wanted to write this with me, and since then the scope has sort of been growing. Um, he he actually programs in Haskell as his day job, um, and so he wants to have more. He keeps referring to it as the Haskell, the, the missing documentation. So he wants to have examples, concise but useful examples for a whole bunch of libraries. So the scope is now grown to include a whole bunch of libraries. Um, <clears throat> and we also, both of us wanted to, um, you can learn Haskell and you can start using Haskell. And then if you start trying to talk to people on, you know, Haskell Reddit or um, the subreddit or even on Twitter, right, you get all these guys like, Runar and Connor McBride and um, Brian McKenna, right? And say these things from their background in logic or, you know, about type theory and stuff that are really, for most of us, incomprehensible. Um, I have some background in logic, so it's not completely incomprehensible to me, but there's a lot of new vocabulary and then they start talking about category theory and there's a lot to, um, there's a lot to know if you really want to participate in the Haskell community, right? So we decided to um, 
in addition to having the kind of reference to um, some foundations of Haskell and some syntactic stuff and the GHC extensions and then some documentation for libraries, we decided to also have um, some explanations of what some of these terms from logic and category theory mean. Now, they're just going to be introductions, um, but like, we talk about functors a lot in Haskell, right? And people, particularly when they're fairly new to Haskell, they identify the concept of functor really strongly with the type class functor, right? But there's so many kinds of functors. And so um, we're kind of structuring the book where, uh, for example, we'll have a kind of one page explanation of what the concept of functor means from category theory. And then in that section, there'll be, um, then coverage of a whole bunch of stuff in Haskell, right? So you can con connect the concept of a functor to all these different kinds of functors that we have in Haskell. And to then some libraries that make particularly good use of interesting functors, right? So that's kind of how we're structuring the book, sort of there's a concept, and then there's a whole bunch of examples from different libraries or perhaps using different GHC extensions um, so that you can Things are connected, but you can also kind of choose your own path, right? Like, oh, I already understand the functor type class, and what I really want to learn about is bifunctors or whatever, so bifunctors will be in that you know, functor section. Applicative functors will be as well, of course. So, yes? Yeah, I guess I'm sure you know that, that um, what O. Charles did a sequence on 20 days of Haskell extensions yes. that was really interesting. Yes, it is. So, so more of that would be very Yes. Helpful. Yeah, because there's just so many and they're really, some of them are hard to, um, <clears throat> I think are not very easily discoverable. Right. And with practical examples that are not just saying what to type all the way. Yeah. Right, yes. Um, on, also sort of on that, I mean, it's not too off the topic, but so so you mentioned the, the sort of the, the monoid bound instance for applicative, I guess. Um, could you go over some ways you might use that? What do you mean by use it? Well, you know, I mean, I know it's, there it is. There it is. So, so for example, you could use this to, I mean, I've never used that, that particular instance before, and so I'm curious. You've never used the tuple applicative instance before, is that? Tuple applicative all the time. Okay. But then there was that monoid thing in there that you said. That, well, the tuple applicative has that monoid constraint. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So really, I mean, really all applicative functors are, I brought this up because I wanted to show you the kind of thing that we're, like, I didn't know about lambda case before Chris Martin discovered that somewhere in the GHC documentation and <clears throat> has started using it a lot. And so we put this on our, on our, this is our book site, right? Our book website. We kind of put this there to demonstrate Lambda case. And like when we announced that we were writing a new book together and people went to the website to look at it, like a whole bunch of people told us they had never seen Lambda case before and, and what a useful example this is, right? It's clear, but it does now. And just from this one little example, and they never knew about it before, and it's kind of a handy little thing. So um, that's that's what we're hoping to do with the, uh, with the book. Um, all right, so getting back to your question about applicative functors. So they, they always actually have a monoid there. <clears throat> it's just usually not explicit. So you only need to make the constraint explicit when there's, a, um, when there's some kind of A value. Right, so when you've had to partially apply, I, I guess I shouldn't say A because there could be even more, right, it could be even more higher kinded than that, but if you've had to partially apply the type constructor to one of the type parameters, then you need to have a monoid constraint on the type parameter. Because I, mean, I guess in the, obviously in your applicative, maybe there, there's nothing monoid about that, right, there, there's no thing in there. It's just like, well, give me the first one that happens to be just. Uh, but that is, that is actually a monoid. So, it's actually monoids, well, <clears throat> what they say is that monoids are actually what give rise to applicative functors. So supposedly every monoid gives rise to an applicative functor. I guess you're speaking in the general. Yes. General category theory monoid, not the Haskell specific monoid class. Right, not the Haskell specific because we don't, um, for various reasons, we don't have, like we have a zip list applicative and you could make a zip list monoid, a corresponding monoid, I mean, that monoid exists theoretically, and you can make it, and, um, but we don't actually have that in a Haskell. It's in some libraries. 
pretty short, but it's not in you know base or anything like that. Even though it could be, but people argue about the implementation details. So. I guess well, not to get too, but one of the things that's always been sort of unclear to me, it would be nice to see a, a real like a explanation of is the the relationship between monoids and one F plus and that whole adapting there's like an adapter where you can adapt between one F plus and monoids and you know how does that fit together <laughs> and where might you use this where might you use that um if you, i guess if you probably if you didn't talk about one F, one F plus no, I, I'm not at all prepared to talk about monad plus. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. but, but in theory, it's the same thing, right? It's just yeah. a monad version of it. has a, an MD and it has a plus. So yes. Therefore, it's a yes. Yeah. Well, monads are also right. monoids, right? right. Yes. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're monoids of functors, right? Yeah. Just like. Um, Alternative is also monoids, right? There's, there's monoids everywhere. All Haskell is just monoids. That's, that's all there is. All just monoids and semi groups. Because you don't always need the identity, right? So, yeah, I'm sorry. I should have probably prepared to talk about monoid plus, but I'm not at all prepared for that. <laughs> okay. Well, I think in the recording, probably a lot of your comments are not going to be, um, we're not loud enough to get caught, and I didn't do a good job of repeating it, so I'm sorry about that. I think, um, so I apologize if you were expecting me to just talk for 50 minutes. Um, I'm, I'm really more of a teacher, so I teach, and I like for the audience to tell me what they're not understanding, and I like for the audience to, to talk back, because that's how you know your students are, you know, Paying attention and learning and stuff like that, and I think um, giving a talk for 50 minutes is really hard for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. In the very beginning, you mentioned uh, the way you kind of did. You mentioned the way you did there. Yep. Uh, is that just offensive to say? Of saying what? Yeah, that's a fancy way of saying it's not commutative. So there are um, commutative. Um, there are commutative monoids, right? Yeah. Yes, but they don't have to be. And so um, in this case, when you're only requiring that they be associative, then you write it as an ordered pair so that you're explicitly saying this is not commutative. Is there a concept of, like, obviously some monoids are commutative. And some monoids are It's a are useful commutative. property to have. It but is. Obviously, like, things like list concatenation, you don't get to swap the arguments around. Right. But is there is there a way to express, like, you know, like a type class or something where I can express that this is not only a combined, but it's, it's, they're kind of like, I put in the type system that, that you know, these, these ones the dependent type stock is downstairs. Yeah, the dependent type, <laughs> again, the dependent type stock is downstairs. So, um, I mean, it's the same for monoid. Yes. It, it doesn't enforce that, that it's actually a monoid. Like, you could write that instance. It's, it's, but, but when you put monoid in the type signature, you're saying, I, I, I think I'm following these rules. Yes. Right? But, well, you can test that you're following the rules, right? That's what we have to quick check and stuff for. You should, and, you, and you should be, right? You should be testing that your monoid instance follows the laws. Right, right. Yeah. But if you had another instance, like, Said I'm following more laws. You're I following guess, even more laws. Yeah. Uh, sure. I guess it would, but it, but the, the the methods would be exactly the same as the monoid methods, right? So it would it would just be a new laws class. It wouldn't be a. You only have those methods that are laws that you follow. You can't check any laws that you don't have. Well, you would supposing you wanted to say this is a monoid, but you can flip the arguments. But add the constraint that it be yeah, yeah. also commutative. Yeah. yeah. Because that's important. If, if then you're like optimizing your changing code, like you know that I don't have to worry about the order in which I combine these things. Um, and that that's actually makes a lot of stuff a lot simpler. If you're writing a monoid instance and you, you don't care about the order, then it's you know it's one less thing you're about. Right. Um, so I guess maybe maybe that just doesn't exist. Probably internet library. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, there's certainly the concept mathematically of a, you know, commutative monoid, and so, um, 
there's got to be some way, right? When people ask me all the time, can you do such and such in Haskell? Like, usually the answer is yes, there is some way to do it, but. Um, so you could just make a supervisor. Yeah. There's no methods, but then everybody's excited crazy. Yeah. Are you doing this? Yes. Yeah. So. There's no way to force it. Yeah, I don't think there's a way to enforce it, but. Yeah. Because you can't, but, but the same as models, you can't enforce model right. right. So, Well, they sort of enforce it by the fact that. I mean, that you can have these two methods and then you can write a bunch of tests that just use these methods and they enforce a little bit of like, Well, you can enforce it exactly the same way with the right. Right. Yeah. It's it's just, nothing, it doesn't introduce any methods. Yeah, well, you may as well just define community monoid as a subclass of monoid. Right. right. Unless you gave it a method that said it non deterministic swaps the arguments around just to prevent you from relying on it. Yeah. <laughs> and you can force it using a set. You do you use sets of arguments. Yes. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so right. Mconcat has to take a set. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. But I would just like, help your yes. yes, Gary. The, um, I've heard from the books and in talks that models are associative, so therefore, you know, you can parallelize them, for example. Um, but I've never heard anybody really say, and that's why the Haskell compiler, or I'm wondering if you know if anyone here knows, does anybody anywhere actually say, oh, it's a model, it's a parallelized it's a file display? I've heard it. I have, um, I have a program that has various computations that they run, and, and they have, they thread state for them, but they return, they return models. And so then that means the callers can then combine the monoids. I guess that's a community thing. No, it's not community. It's, yeah, they return the mon monoids and then the caller is going to combine them together. So the caller knows that I can parallelize these two sub computations because I'm just going to combine them together. I was confused if you were asking about compile time parallelization or uh, runtime parallelization. I think I was confused asking. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't think, I don't think the compiler will do anything for like it, just you as the programmer. You know that because I put these constraints on it, I can therefore, if I want, I can I can you know put these around. So it's somebody like it's like you put a restriction on it that says if you if you this restriction makes it. This is going to happen in Haskell, but sometimes you use this all the time if you have like map reduces. I was going to say also, you know, we work, we work with methods and, and they have this complicated verbose way of saying, by the way, your functions should be deterministic and also that, you know, so they're saying monoids. They're saying they should be monoids, but, but they're saying it you know, in, in many more words. And of course, there's no enforcement and you know, language just says, like, if you do this, you're also going to crash your after. I think it's important that it's structured the way operation comes from um, Well, the function, because it's in, not in Haskell, you're free to write whatever you want in the function, you know, it will check after the fact, it will like run the thing and then it will say, by the way, this, this looks like it's turned out to be forced to The first production Haskell program I, I wrote was, and still being used today, used parallel with the applicatives. And that worked out really well. Is that like the, the whatever, the par, par Yeah, there's a par applicative, this, yeah. All right, yes, thank you. Thank you.